the hand. So first we're talking about the intrinsic muscular system of the hand. So just going through the muscles, there are four thenar muscles. Um, the and remember the intrinsic muscles are the muscles that are kind of within the hand only. They are not crossing the wrist joint. The wrist joint would be, or sorry, extrinsic muscles would be ones that cross the wrist as well. Okay, so like um, extensor or flexor pollicis longus, something like that. Okay, so the intrinsic muscles of the thumb or the thenar intrinsic muscles include flexor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis, opponens pollicis, and adductor pollicis. Um, in general, that side of our hand, the thumb side, is innervated by the median nerve. The only exception to that is adductor pollicis. So you can already picture in your head that if you have median nerve compression, it will not affect adductor pollicis. So you'll still have thumb adduction, okay? But um, opposition, abduction, and flexion will all be affected with a median nerve compression like carpal tunnel syndrome. And we have three hypothenar or pinky muscles, okay? And the ulnar side tends to be on the pinky side. So it makes sense that all of these are innervated by the ulnar nerve, which include abductor digiti minimi, flexor digiti minimi, and opponens digiti minimi. Okay. And then we also have the dorsal and palmar interosei and the lumbricals. I've talked a lot about the lumbricals, like describing a lumbrical grip, right? So lumbrical grip, if you do it with your hand, you can see there's MCP flexion and IP extension. That's a lumbrical grip because those lumbrical muscles are creating those motions, okay? And the dorsal and palmar interosei. So the palmar interosei adduct the metacarpal joints and the dorsal abduct, okay? So kind of abduct and adduct at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. So the extrinsic muscles of the hand, we have the flexor system first, flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, palmaris longus, flexor digitorum superficialis, and flexor digitorum profundus. All of these should make sense to you as far as which nerve innervates them in general because of the location. Again, that median nerve kind of hits more, um, more of the muscles that are on the thumb side um, of the flexors area. Remember the radial nerve is more the extensor muscle group. So don't be thrown off by flexor carpi radialis, okay? It's still median nerve, okay? Flexor carpi ulnaris because it's on the ulnar side, um, or excuse me, the um, pinky side, it's gonna be the ulnar nerve. Palmaris longus is in the middle. Flexor digitorum superficialis, also kind of the middle, which is more median nerve territory. And then flexor digitorum profundus is split in half, okay? So the pinky side is the ulnar distribution and the um, thumb side is the median nerve distribution. So extrinsic muscles of the hand, the extensors system, all innervated by the radial nerve, okay? So extensor carpi radialis longus, E extensor carpi, carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris, okay? And all of them tell you kind of what they do, right? Extend and adduct the wrist. In other words, ul ulnarly deviate the wrist, right? That's why it's ulnaris. Extensor digitorum, it extends the fingers at the first, at the metacarpal phalangeal joint, the PIP and the DIP. So all of those joints are extended by extensor digitorum. But extensor digiti minimi also helps to extend the pinky finger at MCP, PIP, and DIP. So pinky has an extra, extra extensor. And extensor indices. This muscle also lies deep to the extensor digitorum and extends the index finger, right? Index indices. That makes sense. Okay. It's named after what it's doing. Okay, the arthrokinematics of the wrist. These are important to know because they help us with joint mobilization, okay? So you can see from the picture here, the carpal bones uh, kind of create a convex surface together and the radius and ulna create a concave surface. So open chain, which is almost all of our upper extremity movements um, are open chain. 
is going to be convex on concave, okay? The wrist allows for flexion, extension, radial deviation, and ulnar deviation. Supination and pronation come between the radio ulnar joints, okay? So the actual radiocarpal and midcarpal joints are flexion, extension, radial deviation, and ulnar deviation. <clears throat> okay, and then the arthrokinematics of the hand, okay? So um, this first picture here is the CMC, which is the saddle joint, okay? And I tried to find a good picture for you guys, but it's hard to, to, hard to find the CMC joint um, or have it make total sense with just a picture, okay? But remember, first CMC is unique, it's a saddle. So it allows for flexion extension, and that's a concave on convex motion. And remember flexion extension versus abduction adduction. Let me see if I can get abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, right? Uh, I hope I did that right. Um, and the abduction, adduction movement is convex on concave. So hence, when you're doing abduction, the glide is gonna be in the opposite direction of the osteokinematic motion. That's why when we did it in class, you almost feel it as you go into abduction, it should kind of disappear under your finger, right? It goes backward as the osteokinematic movement goes forward. And opposition occurs as a rotation. Um, MCP and IPs is all concave on convex. Think of how we did the first MTP um, to improve extension at that joint. It's the same thing with these fingers, okay? So it's concave and convex. So you're gonna be doing a little bit of distraction and then going into either a palmar or a do dorsal glide in order to improve the motion and you're going in the direction that the osteokinematic motion would go because it's concave on convex. Okay, and just to review sensation of the hand, we talked about this a little bit in lecture the other day, but thinking about the distribution, if you're trying to figure out if maybe a nerve is affected or maybe a dermatome, if you're trying to figure out if there's spinal nerve involvement, knowing your dermatomes. So C6, C7, and C8 across the hand in particular are very, very helpful to just do a quick sensation test. But we also need to be aware of ulnar, median, and radial nerve and their sensations on the hand and the wrist. Okay. Wrist extension and grip strength. First off, why is wrist extension needed for gripping? Well, we've touched on this a lot. And my best explanation always goes back to a patient who has had a spinal cord injury, who has um, is using that kind of that tenodesis grip in order to grip things. So if we extend our wrist, our hand naturally flexes because our flexors, if they're tight at all, they close down as we extend the wrist because they're going to be put on stretch. So then they essentially shut in order to because they're too tight, right? That's why we don't stretch out a patient who is using that as a spinal cord injury patient in order to grip, right? Because we want their flexors to be tight so that the minute they use their wrist extensors, their hand goes into a gripped position and they can grip things. So they want tightness in their flexors, okay? So it's the same thing. When you hold your wrist in a slightly extended position, the muscles operating the fingers can pull the tendons and therefore the finger bones more easily which results in better control of the fingers, right? So our grip strength is highest when we are between 20 and 45 degrees of wrist extension. It's very hard to grip when you are in full flexion, right? Because at this point, now my extensors are stretched and I'm trying to flex further, but if my extensors are tight at all, they're not gonna let, allow my hand to close, okay? So it's the opposite of that tenodesis grip. Osteokinematic motions of the wrist and hand. Okay, so for review, distal radial ulnar joint, as I said, is prox or excuse me, is pronation and supination movements. Radiocarpal is wrist flexion extension and radial and ulnar deviation. Same thing with the intercarpal joints, okay, between the carpal bones. MCP, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and circumduction, right? You can do um, circumduction or circles uh, with your fingers at your MCP joints. And IPs are flexion and extension to neutral, right? We don't have any extension past zero degrees in theory, okay? 
Okay, now we're going to talk about bony injuries to the wrist and the hat hand. Okay, fractures to the forearm, wrist, and digits are very common, right? We use our hands all the time. There's a lot of small muscles, a lot of small bones, but it makes sense that we would damage them quite often um, because we're using them, you know, vigorously in every everyday life, typing, writing, grabbing things, playing instruments, okay? So... Um, let's start with, let's see. Oh, reduction. Hang on one second. Fractures, uh, the stability of the reduction determines the timing and progression of the exercise program. So, um, we'll review what it means to have a reduction. We've talked a lot about it, but just to give you an idea and that kind of guides what you're going to do, right? Was it reduced with surgery? Was it reduced just by conservative measures? Okay. So reduction is a surgical procedure to repair a fracture or dislocation in the correct alignment. So a closed reduction is a procedure to set or reduce a broken bone without cutting the skin open. The broken bone is put back into place, like relocated, let's say, um, which allows it to grow back together in better alignment. If there's like a fracture dislocation, okay, or whatever it is, they can do a closed reduction to kind of get the bones back together and hope that they heal correctly. Open reduction means that the broken bone is realigned during surgery. In other words, an open procedure. They have to cut open your body, okay? Internal fixation refers to the components that are used to stabilize the bone. So an open reduction internal fixation would mean it's an open procedure, and then they're using fixators in order to um, kind of keep the, uh, make sure that the bone heals correctly, okay? Okay, so let's talk about two different kinds of radial and ulnar fractures to start. The first one is a Collie's fracture. It's also known as the dinner fork fracture, hence why there's a picture of a dinner fork, okay? This happens with a Fouche injury um, where you land on your, with your wrist extended, which would be kind of a normal way that at least I would think to land would be kind of with my hand out trying to stop myself from falling and you land on your hand, okay? So usually the result of a fall on the palm of your hand, which displaces the bone upward or dorsally, okay? So that radius kind of fractures and gets pushed upward when you hit the ground, okay? Um, this one is a really, really common injury to the wrist, uh, most likely will require reduction um, and immobilization, okay? And again, with fractures, most patients heal within six to eight weeks. We might see them earlier, but we always follow the precautions of the physician. Smith fracture is the exact opposite. It's when you land on a flexed wrist, okay? Or if there is a direct blow to the back of the forearm, it could also fracture too, but in general, it's gonna be a flexed wrist. So Collies and Smith fractures are the exact opposite, okay? And it's the same thing though. It's the distal radius um, that fractures and then it gets pushed essentially palmarly, right? And again, maybe surgery surgery needed, maybe an open reduction internal fixation if it, we can't get the bones to kind of approximate. Okay, so those are the two radius fractures that are most common to see in the wrist. Ulnar fractures, not as common because look how small the ulnar articulation is as compared to the radius at the wrist joint, right? So usually it occurs in conjunction with a distal radius fracture, okay? Rehab follows the same guidelines as a radial fracture, okay? You're going to wait for the bone to heal, follow the protocol, usually six to eight weeks, depending on if there's an ORIF or not that's performed and then treating according to the protocol, probably having to do a lot of soft tissue mobilization, looking for signs of CRPS because it's the hand, um, treating those acute kind of pain and swelling and then gentle range of motion, okay? Um, something that can happen more often is the ulnar styloid process will fracture. Um, that bone is sticking out a tiny bit. You can even see from this picture, you can see that tiny ulnar styloid fracture ulnar styloid process that kind of sticks out a tiny bit more. Okay, 
rehab following a radius fracture or that ulnar fracture, as, as I said, it's the same protocol, okay? It's going to start as, stu as soon as stable immobilization has been achieved, okay? You're gonna reduce edema through positioning and retrograde massage, um, maintain digit range of motion through exercise, light gripping, pinching, and use of the fingers is encouraged as long as there is no pain. That's if you even have access, if they're immobilized. Um, but once they once they do come out of their cast, then you can start to kind of progress this further as long as x-rays show that everything has healed correctly. <clears throat> Okay. Oh, sorry. Exercises to maintain MCP and IP movement and flexibility. So finger flexion, extension, opposition, adduction, and abduction. You're just moving the fingers as much as you can to keep the mobility alive there. Um, and this is the six pack hand exercises. Um, it, this is in your book, I believe. You do not have to follow with this necessarily, but it's showing all the different kinds of motions to try as a for giving to your patients as far as exercises go. If they do have maybe a colleague's fracture, but they have been, their protocol is allowing finger movement, right? You can do a lot to kind of keep the tendons moving and strong. Okay, so this just gives you an idea. Open, closed finger, straightening the fingers, doing essentially a lumbrical grip with that knuckle bend with the straight fingers, a karate chop, closed fist. Um, you can even put rubber bands around their fingers and have them kind of push if you want to add some resistance training to these. Okay, and soft splint is usually worn after a cast removal. Again, it really depends on the physician and the patient's age. Um, then we can start, if it's a soft splint, usually there's some kind of protocol where you're allowed to take off the splint for physical therapy. So you can do kind of gentle active assist and active range of motion, soft tissue massage to kind of keep the structures loose and the soft tissue extensibility strong. Um, and then, Joint mobilization is very, very helpful, but you do have to be 100% sure that all the bones have healed, right? At that point, there are probably adhesions that have kind of limited the patient's range of motion, and you do want to work on joint mobilization to kind of get regain some of the motions, okay? But you do need to make sure that x-ray shows that everything's healed and you're good to go, okay? You could progress with very gentle grade one, grade two joint mobilizations early on to help treat the pain. But grade three, grade four, you you need to really make sure from the PT and from the physician that you're okay to do that. Okay, complications of radial fractures. So malunion, nonunion, nerve compression, CRPS. Again, these are all kind of things that we always worry about with um, fractures, right? A nonunion, a malunion, nerve compression specifically in the hand at the radius. If there is like a palmar um, dislocation of the right fracture dislocation and that fractured piece dislocates anteriorly, I would worry about the median nerve, right? Are they starting to show signs of median nerve compression? Okay, well, maybe we need the patient to go back to the doctor and get another x-ray done, right? Making sure there's not compression at the, of the median nerve or maybe swelling is increasing pressure on that median nerve or ulnar nerve or radial nerve, okay? And of course, CRPS. We're always looking for signs of CRPS, especially with the hand, hands and the feet, okay? And, oh, I guess I didn't have a slide on this. Just to remind yourself too, as far as the signs of CRPS, remember it's the hypersensitivity, the sensitivity of you kind of like a towel brushing up against their hands, something like that is way more extreme than it should be, right? And usually it's, um. It's, it could be after a fracture, that kind of thing, eventually. And, and if you can treat it, if you can find it early, it's easier to treat by the physician. So that's why we always send patients back. You need to go check with your physician about this. I'm worried about these symptoms you're having, right? And following up with the PT as well regarding that. Okay, carpal fractures. Okay, there's a couple um, bones that are way more likely to fracture specifically scaphoid is the most common. Um, the trapezoid and actually lunate are probably more, co more common than the other ones at that point, okay? Uh, lunates specifically tend to dislocate um, 
But for the most part, the main bone that we're worried about is the scaphoid for multiple reasons. So scaphoid tends to be fall on an outstretched hand or a foosh injury fracturing the bone. So scaphoid fractures fall on the palm with the wrist hyperextended and radially deviated maybe really the main thing that a patient might say is I fell with my hand outstretched like that. I fell with my palm kind of facing the ground. So often it is dismissed as a sprain. Um, this is specifically because x-rays a lot of times won't actually show a fracture at the scaphoid the first time around. Patients might have to go back in a few days to get another x-ray done or um, you sometimes, sometimes physicians, if they can't tell if there's a fracture, but there's pain over the anatomical snuff box and the mechanism's injury was a foosh injury, they'll treat it like it is a scaphoid fracture just in case, okay? You don't wanna miss this um, as a physician. So it's possible that X-ray would be inconclusive, but we're still gonna treat it like it's a scaphoid fracture. So pain and swelling at the anatomical snuff box, pain with wrist extension that is unresolved um, are signs that further evaluation that further evaluation is needed and possible involvement of the scaphoid. So if you've got a patient who the doctor has told them, no, I don't see any signs of an um, of a fracture on the X-ray, but they have pain and tenderness along the anatomical snuff box, and their injury was a foosh injury it's possible that they'll need to go back to their physician and get another x-ray done at some point, maybe when the swelling has gone down a little bit, just to make sure. So fractures are really concerning at the scaphoid because of the blood supply to this bone. This is, has a really interesting blood supply, which is the distal part of the scaphoid bone actually has that blood supply come through it first and then it makes it, its way pro the blood supply makes its way proximally after that through the bone so if you have a fracture through your scaphoid bone and it cuts off that blood supply the proximal part of the scaphoid is the part that could possibly die because of avascular necrosis, right? The blood supply stops, so you'll have a non-union avascular necrosis, and that part of the bone will die, okay? So that's why we're always looking for uh, making sure patients are, you know, if there is a suspected scaphoid fracture, making sure that they're going back to their physician to triple check and to make sure that everything is healing correctly okay so again scaphoid fractures mechanism of injury falling on kind of the lateral aspects or radially deviating their hand while the hand is hyperextended extended in other words a foosh, foosh injury with for some reason more pressure through the radial aspect hence hitting that scaphoid bone okay um and then just to make a note to <clears throat> The lunate bone, I don't think I have slides about this. Oh, there's a picture of scaphoid, the distal fracture, waist fracture, proximal fracture. Again, that proximal aspect of the scaphoid is where that blood supply kind of is last in the bone and therefore is susceptible to dying if the, there is a full fracture through the bone. And there's a picture of someone landing kind of on the radial aspect of their hand with their hand hyperextended. Okay, scaphoid fracture rehab begins during immobilization. Primary focus is edema reduction and range of motion on the uninvolved distal joints. Following cast removal, they'll use a spica splint, which is kind of one that just kind of keeps their thumb out like that a little bit, okay? Wrist exercises that focus on gliding of the wrist and finger muscles. In other words, if you're kind of doing this, you're kind of getting your extensors and your flexors to glide. Um, through the tendon sheaths so you're not getting kind of adhesions via the muscles um, and you're not kind of getting any um, any kind of adhesions forms that might limit motion in general. So you can also strengthen with putty, grip activities, closed chain activities like weight bearing through the hand once you're cleared to do that and then return to full activity within 12 weeks of cast removal for this. Okay, metacarpal fractures. Oh, I was gonna touch very, very briefly on lunate bone, just because the lunate bone does um, have a history of dislocation. Um, 
So it's found in the proximal row, median to the scaphoid, and it's susceptible to a volar or an anterior dislocation into the carpal tunnel during a fall on an outstretched hand. So it kind of dislocates palmarly as you kind of hit the ground. Okay. So it's not very, it's not as common as a scaphoid bone, but because of where the lunate is, think of where the lunate bone is. Where's the picture? There it is. You can picture it's right at the carpal tunnel. So if that lunate bone dislocates anteriorly, it could cause signs of median nerve damage. Okay. So a patient might present almost like they have carpal tunnel, but they have this mechanism of injury where maybe they fell on an outstretched hand and the lunate bone dislocated and kind of caused median nerve damage by pushing on that carpal tunnel area. Okay. Okay. Metacarpal fractures. So metacarpal fractures occur from falls, jammed fingers, direct blows. They can be non-displaced or min minimally displaced fractures. This is a metacarpal. So not the PIP or the DIP necessarily, but think of the MCP. Okay. So a place um, in a cast or a splint for three to four weeks, usually including the joint above and the joint below the fracture. That's pretty common that if you have um, a fracture somewhere, usually the joint above and the joint below are also stabilized, okay? Um, the joint is placed in 45 to 60 degrees of flexion in order to prevent collateral ligament short shortening. So the collateral ligament is in a shortened position when the MCP is extended, okay? So those collateral ligaments are on the, each side of the MCPs, okay? You can see in the picture, in picture B, the two sides there. So you don't want them to be in a shortened position while you're in the splint or else when you come out of the splint, you're not gonna have flexibility at the MCP. So they put it in a slightly flexed position so that that collateral ligament is not too tight once they come out of the splint, okay? Metacarpal fractures, okay? So there's such a thing as a, what's called a bo boxer's fracture, okay? Fractures of the neck of the fourth and fifth metacarpal, specifically when patients strike a hard object with a clench clenched fist, okay? Our fourth and fifth tend to be affected the most, our fourth and fifth metacarpals, okay? Um, the wrist is immobilized in slight extension and the MCP is joint is flexed again for those collateral ligaments at the MCP. Um, and that would be for about three to four weeks. And PIP joints are free to flex and extend often within 24 hours, okay? So you actually might be able to see this patient and work on their range of motion at PIP and DIP, okay? Rehab, same as always, we're treating what we find early on within the limits of that this is a fracture and our patient is immobilized, right? So we're going to help to decrease the edema, massage, elevation, modalities, patient education. In other words, don't have the patient with their hand by their side the whole day, right? We want to play gravity to our favor, which is keeping their hand kind of up on a desk or above their heart, not hanging down by their side where that swelling will increase, active range of motion to PIP and DIP since they are free to move, and tendon gliding to decrease the risk of adhesions. Again, kind of thinking about, okay, can I get movement here? How can I do that? So that at just PIP and DIP to kind of keep the, the tendons from adhesing down, okay? And over time, we'll progress to strengthening once you're cleared by the MD. A Bennett fracture is a fracture of the palmar base of the proximal first metacarpal, so the thumb, okay? Because of the muscular attachments to the first met, the shaft of the first met will be pulled radially and dorsally, essentially causing a fracture dislocation as well, okay? So once you have that little fracture, the shaft essentially of that first met is pulled, okay? And it's pulled by, what is it? Abductor pollicis longus, Okay, when it gets pulled, essentially it's pulling away from that fracture site. So you get a dislocation as well as the fracture. Okay, some of the stability is lost at that MCP joint. Um, rehab can begin once the fractured piece is stabilized and healing well. So maybe they'll be able to just do an immobilization for this patient and hope that that bone heals, but then they might have some soft tissue with uh, limitations or restrictions to deal with after the fact. And a, a phalanx fracture, okay? So it can occur at the neck shaft or base of the phalanx, 
It's usually a stable closed non-displaced fracture that's easy to treat with buddy tape. So buddy taping is where you tape two fingers together. That can You can do that with a jammed finger as well if it's PIP or DIP, maybe playing basketball, something like that. Essentially, you know, buddy taping is you tape the two fingers together. So they're, they get to be buddies, okay, during that time. Um, more complex fractures. Um, will be placed in a hand-based splint for three to four weeks. Okay, so a splint that kind of holds their hand in a certain position as well. Splints usually keep the MCP and PIP in slightly in a slightly flexed position. So you kind of end up like that, okay? Um, that sometimes does result in loss of PIP joint extension as a complication, okay? So if you're slightly flexed and then you finally come out of that cast, you might lose full PIP or um, extension something to work on in physical therapy or hand therapy if you become a hand therapy expert. Okay, so a T TFCC, triangular fibrocartilage complex. So the TFCC, you can see I put a picture up of it, is the ulnar side of the wrist and it connects the ulna to the carpal bones. It primarily functions um, as to transmit forces from the hand to the forearm, provide stability to the joint, and support the load-bearing capacity of the wrist, okay? So the TFCC can be strained during gri gripping, and you can also damage it during a foosh in injury when the forearm is pronated, okay? Or an axial force is applied to the ulnar side of the wrist. I think I have a better picture if I can go to almost the very beginning see if I can. Uh, nope. Where was it? Oh, here we go. So that little space there at the ulna where, you know, it almost just looks like empty space. That's where TFCC is. Okay. Right at that distal ulna kind of matching up with the carpal bones. Okay. Can go back to that slide if you want to. Oops, there we go. So as I said, it's also a foosh injury where you can kind of damage that little cartilage area. Okay. So TFCC, patient would present with pain on the ulnar side of the wrist. Initial treatment is rest and splinting of the wrist and elbow to prevent forearm rotation for four to six weeks. We don't want forearm rotation at TFCC. In other words, pronation, supination to kind of disrupt the healing process. Okay. There's a poor blood supply, so sometimes this area requires surgery as well. Um, and again, as always, there's a gradual program of range of motion and progressive strengthening per the protocol from the physician. So if you have a patient who has TFCC as um, damage to their TFCC from a foosh injury, you're going to follow the protocol. Maybe in four weeks, you're able to do gentle passive range of motion, and then you're able to do kind of grade one, grade two joint mobilization, and then you move on from there, okay? And there's another picture of it. Okay, next injury, we're talking about skier's thumb. So this is an acute sprain of the ulnar or medial collateral ligament of the thumb. Treatment um, of a partially torn ligament is a thumb spica cast. So remember the thumb spica cast kind of holds it out like that, okay? So again, the collateral ligament was something we talked about with the MCP joint as well. Let me see if I can find it. I'm gonna go back to that picture too. Since that was, here we go. Picture B um, or picture A showing the collateral ligaments kind of on the sides of the metacarpal phalangeal joints, okay? So, with the skier's thumb, here we go, um, it would be a tear of one of those ligaments, okay? So the splint worn continuously for three to four weeks. Um, edema reduction, again, looking for signs of um, CRPS, gentle soft tissue mobilization. As much as the physician will allow us to do, we will do in order to make sure that stiffness doesn't occur at that thumb joint because that's an important joint for us to be able to utilize for the rest of our lives, okay? Active thumb, MCP and composite, CMC, MCP and IP joints um, when splint is removed. So you're doing as much range of motion as you can once, this, once you're allowed to. And then gentle progressive strengthening five to six weeks out. <clears throat> 
Okay, ligament injuries or sprains of the wrist. So ligament sprains with varying ligament sprains with varying degrees of carpal instability, usually from a fall with the wrist hyperextended. So there's a lot of small um, ligaments, um, fascia in our wrist. So maybe a patient has a foosh injury, they're really, really swollen, but there's no sign of a fracture or dislocation. Maybe they have a pretty severe ligament sprain. Okay, so they could also be put in a splint for three to four weeks. And then um, if it's severe, if this if the ligaments are torn, then they could do a rigid, rigid cast immobilization um, or an ORIF to create some stability in the wrist and the hand. Okay. Um, in general, our hope is that we get to do as much therapy as possible with these patients because we want to make sure that we're improving the strength and their flexibility while not aggravating the ligaments that have been sprained. But remember what ligaments do for us, they create some stability. So these patients are going to be a little bit unstable, a little bit hypermobile, hence why sometimes they'll do a rigid cast immobilization to actually hope that some scar tissue forms and creates some stability for the joint. Okay, so as I said, your control, as always, I mean, you're controlling the pain and inflammation after immobilization, gentle, active, pain free motion in all planes. Although, again, you're starting with passive motion and moving on to active motion after that. Mm. And then moving on to tendon gliding, forearm rotation, or pronation, supination. Um, isometric contractions, and then you're progressively pushing forward to resistance exercises, and then maybe increasing the speed of movement as well. Okay, so extender, extensor tendons and their sheets. So we've talked a lot about tendon gliding. So the tendons have these tunnels that are in our hands where they have to go through these tunnels, hence why adhesions become um, a real problem. If an adhesion forms kind of within this tunnel, it can kind of bind down the tendon and stop us from being able to do um, kind of flexion or extension movement. Okay, so we talk a lot about tendon gliding to keep the tendons moving within their sheaths or those tunnels. So tendons from the extrinsic muscles pass through fibrosseous tunnels or under the retinacula that serve as pulleys to hold the tendons in place close to the bone, keeping them from bowstringing or improving their mechanical efficiency. The tendons are subject to compressive stress, especially at the proximal edge of these pulleys, which can lead to thickening of the pulley and the tendon, okay? So in some cases, the tendon develops a nodule that has difficulty gliding under the pulley. So picture on the tendon, there's like a nodule or a little knot somewhere, right? Just like if you were pulling string through a thread or threading a needle, but there was a big knot in the thread, could you get it through the needle or would it get stuck? Okay, so when it's gliding under the pulley, it causes stress and kind of sharp kind of harsh movements, right? The minute you finally pull it through, it kind of clicks and locks into place, right? So um, another thing to think about is, and we'll talk more about that in a bit, but the other thing is the inflammation of the sheath is called tendovaginitis, okay? So if the sh actual tendon sheath of that tunnel is inflamed, that's another thing that will kind of limit your ability to kind of move the tendons or glide the tendons um, in that area, okay? So Dequer veins disease, okay? So Dequer veins is a specific kind of um, kind of diagnosis with the um, tendons of the thumb kind of going through that little tunnel, okay? So Dequer veins, also known as Dequer veins tenosynovitis or Dequer veins tendonitis is a condition that affects the tendons on the thumb side of the wrist. It's also known as mommy thumb. It's really common to see in patients who are four to six weeks postpartum, okay? So in other words, they just had a baby recently. There's um, an argument to be said that maybe all of a sudden they went from you know, not having to carry um, an object, i.e. a baby all the time to all of a sudden you are thrown into a world where you are carrying a newborn child all the time and you start to aggravate these tendons in your thumb, okay? Maybe there's something to be said too for um, something about maybe the hormones kind of in your body postpartum, if that makes you more susceptible to like a tendon or ligament injury. I don't know that one for sure, okay? I just know it has a higher frequency in 
patients who are four to six weeks postpartum. So it affects the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis tendons and their sheaths, okay? So it presents as pain on the radial side of the wrist. Um, other re sources referred as a tendinosis or a degeneration of the tendon cells and collagen, okay? And to queer vein assessment and treatment, you can do something called the Finkelstein test, which is the first picture here. You have the patient kind of lock their thumb in their fist and then radially deviate. And if that increases the symptoms along the radial aspect of their wrist, it's considered a positive test, okay? Treatment for dequerre veins may include rest, trying to avoid the activities that worsen the symptoms, immobilization, um, or wearing a thumb splint, or even a brace, even if it's not fully immobilized, but just something to kind of give, um, take some of the stress off those tendons that are kind of going over and over again, okay? Medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs to treat the um, inflammation might be given from the physician. And then ice, ice massage modalities to again, treat the pain so that we can therefore treat the dysfunction, right? So hand therapy with symptom improvement, gentle program of range of motion and stretching and strengthening, um, they should get better. But if they don't, there are corticosteroid injections and surgery if we if they wanted to try to, I'm not even sure what the surgery is, maybe cutting the tendinous sheaths around those tendons. I'm not really sure. Um, but for the most part, patients that I've seen at least with this do tend to get better. And if they don't, they go to specific certified hand therapists to be seen as well. Okay, another one kind of dealing with the tendinous, tendinous or those fibro osseous, osseous sheet, um, sheaths or those little tunnels <clears throat> that the tendons kind of run through is something called trigger finger. So when someone has trigger finger, the affected digit may lock or catch in a bent position and then suddenly snap straight or vice versa. Again, think of that little nodule as it's going trying to go through that tunnel. We're kind of pulling as much as we can. It finally passes through, but at that point, your force is so big that it kind of snaps into place. And then same thing when you're trying to bend it, okay? So the affected tendons become inflamed or irritated, causing it to thicken or develop nodules. This makes it difficult for the tendons to glide smoothly through the sheath. It passes through, resulting in the characteristic triggering or catching sensation. So they're going to have finger stiffness, popping or clicking, pain or discomfort at the base of the affected finger or thumb, and swelling in the palm or at the base of the affected finger. Okay, next one is something called mallet finger. So this is an interruption of the extensor tendon mechanism over the DIP um, joint. So there's a DIP flexion contracture that can occur because of the extensor tendon not firing. So it could be a contracture, but it could also just be passive. In other words, we just can't extend that finger fully, but maybe we could passively extend it straight, okay? So a mallet finger occurs when the tendon that straightens the end joint of a finger is damaged or ruptured. This can happen due to a direct blow to the fingertip or forceful hyperextension of the finger. When the tendon is injured, the finger droops downward and cannot be straightened voluntarily. This condition is commonly seen in sports athletes, particularly those involved in ball sports. And actually it says hyperextension in here, but I, I think it's actually a forced hyperflexion because that would stretch that extensor tendon. So I'll double check that, but I believe that should, the, the book might be wrong about that. It is probably hyperflexion. Okay. Um, treatment for mallet finger typically involves immobilizing the fingertip in a, in a like a cute little splint. Okay. And it's called an extension splint. The splint keeps the fingertip in a straightened position allowing the tendon to heal, okay? In some cases, surgery may be required to repair the tendon if the injury is severe or doesn't respond to conservative treatment. And so we might maybe see a patient who had a mallet finger, had surgery, and was immobilized afterward for a bit, and now they need gentle physical therapy to kind of get their range of motion back since they might be immobilized, not just at their DIP, but maybe their PIP, maybe their MCP as well, okay? A swan neck deformity. So the swan neck deformity is characterized by an abnormal position of the finger where the middle joint or the PIP 
is hyperextended while the end joint is flexed. So when that happens, it looks kind of like a swan's neck, right? Think of a swan in the water, how it's hyperextended and then it's flexed at the end. Okay, so it can be caused by various factors, including arthritis, ligament injuries, nerve damage, or genetic conditions such as Ehlers -Danlos, um, Danlos syndrome. Okay, so treatment for swan neck deformity depends on the underlying cause and the severity of the condition. So as always, we're we're treating what we find. Okay, conservative measures may include splinting or taping the finger to correct the alignment. <clears throat> so. From, PI, from PT perspective, we can help to strengthen and improve flexibility in the hand once the immobilization period is over. Maybe they have their finger in full kind of neutral position for eight weeks, all of a sudden everything sticks. So we're trying to gently get range of motion back, but not kind of recreating that swan neck deformity again. Okay, boutonniere deformity is the exact opposite, okay? So it's also known as a buttonhole deformity because it kind of, when you place your hand on a table and you have a boutonniere, it almost looks like a little, kind of like a little tunnel that's created by this. You can see this bottom picture, that the pinky finger there, or maybe that's actually the index finger. So also known as buttonhole deformity, it's characterized by flexion of the PIP and while the DIP and MCP are near the base are hyperextended, okay? So it's the opposite of swan neck, it presents exactly opposite. So it results when the triangular ligament and the central slip of the extensor tendon are disrupted, okay? So when the extensor slip is disrupted, in other words, the kind of area where the extensor tendon runs, it will pull the finger into this position, okay? So this disruption of the ligament and the tendon will cause the lateral bands to displace palmarly. So those bands displace palmarly and it kind of pulls the finger taut, but you end up getting a bend at that finger, at the um, PIP because of those tendons being pulled taut because they're no longer kind of held in place above, they fall down below, okay? So, the goal is to approximate the ends of the tendon so they can heal together via immobilization at the PIP joint, okay? So at that point, probably they're immobilized with their PIP straight so that the tendon can approximate and hopefully heal. Active and passive DI flexion, DIP flexion is encouraged. So you might have something where you're here, but DIP is free to move and we need to encourage movement. After six weeks, active, active motion of the PIP is initiated. So there's a picture for you to kind of see the opposites, the swan neck deformity with the hyperextension at PIP and flexion at DIP, and then the boutonniere, which is hyperflexion at PIP and extension at DIP. And you can almost picture on that boutonniere how if there's um, that tendon that kind of runs on top of the finger, if the tunnel that's holding in place breaks, all of a sudden the tendon kind of slips to one side or the other and pulls the finger into flexion if it's tight at all. Okay, so flexor tendon injuries. We've talked about it with extensors now. Now we're moving on to flexor tendons. So flexor tendon injuries, um, restoration of function following a flexor tendon injury requires careful balance between protecting the repair and gliding the tendons still. There are zones based on where the flexion injury occurs. Okay, so you might have a patient who's like a zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, and then you have some idea of what that exactly means. So zone two becomes the most important to remember, okay? So zone two is from the metacarpals to just distal to the PIP, okay? So that kind of PIP area, okay? Um, damage to the flexor tendons here can affect both finger flexor muscles, flexor digitorum profundus and flexor, flexor digitorum superficialis, because both of those flexor tendons are running in zone two. After zone two, flexor digitorum superficialis only flexes until PIPs. Flexor digitorum profundus goes all the way to the DIPs and flexes there as well. Okay, so if you have damage in zone one, flexor digitorum superficialis is not affected. But zone two, both of those are affected and it becomes a really difficult area to treat.
Oh, and there's pictures of flexor digitorum, oops, flexor digitorum uh, profund or superficialis going just distal to the PIP joint and flexor digitorum profundus going all the way through the DIP to be able to flex them as well. So zone two also is sometimes I believe referred to as no man's land as well, as far as healing goes. It becomes hard to heal, hard to immobilize that area. Um, so as far as kind of listening to physician protocol, if there's a zone two flexor injury, we need to take careful consideration. And again, knowing that both of those groups of tendons run through that those zones becomes important. And there's the picture again. Okay, so three approaches to rehabilitation. One is immobilization. So following the repair, the wrist and hand are casted or splinted for three to four weeks. Again, I don't need you to memorize the three to four weeks or six to eight weeks or whatever it is because it truly is dependent patient to patient. We're going to be following what the doctor says, what their protocol is, okay? They might just be, they might not even know when they first immobilize a patient, how long they're gonna have them immobilized for, but that's what x-rays are for to confirm, okay, is this patient healing? Are they getting better? Is the bone healing? Okay, all of those things. Um, early passive mobilization, once they are allowed to take the, once they are no longer immobilized or maybe they're in a soft splint that they can take off and on and they have been, um, their protocol now allows them to start passive mobilization. So as always, we're starting with passive mobilization, joint mobilizations to kind of loosen up the joints and moving on to active assistive range of motion and then active range of motion. And again, maybe starting isometrics a little bit early as well. And tendon gliding, right? That becomes now a part of the hand therapy is tendon gliding, okay? And then early active immobilization, these patients would be with these programs, the tendon is moved actively within 48 hours of repair and within carefully outlined limits set by the surgeon. So patients who have are cleared for early active mobilization might be patients who are able to go see a certified hand therapist really regularly and are fully compliant, right? That's not gonna be a, an approach that's given to a patient who has dementia, who is not going to follow their protocol, right? You can't, if a patient, you know, can be trusted, it's possible that the doctor would not immobilize certain people, okay, for flex, and this is specifically for flex or tendon injuries. Okay, Dupuytren's disease, I never know how to pronounce this, Dupuytren's disease, also known as Dupuytren's contracture, is a hand condition characterized by the progressive thickening and tightening of the connective tissue beneath the skin of the palm and fingers, okay? So it kind of gets a lot, a lot of tightness right here. Um, and what ends up happening is especially the fourth and fifth, fifth digits end up kind of curling inward because those tendons, that fibrous tissue starts to pull them inward and you end up getting a position like the, like the picture here, okay? So it results in the formation of nodules or cords that can cause the fingers to bend inward toward the palm, making it difficult to fully straighten them. And again, it's usually the fourth and fifth digits that you see that kind of flexion inward. So the nodules can be composed of overactive fibroblasts producing collagen or a lot of fibrous tissue in that area. So the treatment is centered on patient education and sometimes like serial casting um, in order to try to slowly regain the motion as well. Um, cervical or it's not cervical, sorry, steroid injections to loosen up that area um, could be could be utilized as well um, in order to kind of give some relief of pain and tension in that area. As always, if our patient comes in and says, hey, I had a steroid injection yesterday, my hand's feeling a lot better, let's do some therapy, your answer needs to be, oh, you know what, we got to check with the physician because it's possible therapy should be deferred for at least five days, three to five days at the least. Um, a lot of times those times um, it's possible that physicians might not even be aware of that. So it's a good time to maybe call them and, and double check. What's the protocol here? In general, corticosteroid injections make the soft tissue much more fragile. The last thing we want to do is tear um, tear a tendon um, in this area, maybe palmaris longus, something we're concerned about, right? Okay, so moving on oh surgical treatment so technically you could get surgery as well if needed where they'll just cut the contracted fascia 
or remove the regional fasciotomy would be to removal of the diseased fascia. Extensive fasciotomy would be removal of the diseased tissue and any tissue with the potential of becoming diseased in this area. So if we see this patient postoperatively, um, we are again following the protocol from the physician and we're working on ice uh, to decrease the swelling, patient education range of motion, joint mobilization, tendon gliding, again, becomes really important in our hand patients, kind of moving those tendons um, through those sheaths as much as we can to make sure that we don't have adhesions or scar tissues formed that way, okay? Okay, we're moving on to nerve injuries um, via carpal tunnel syndrome. So um, the first one, Carpal tunnel, uh, median nerve. So when the median nerve becomes compressed or squeezed as it travels through the carpal tunnel at the wrist, the carpal tunnel is formed by the bones of the wrist and a thick band of connect connective tissue called the transverse carpal ligament. It usually occurs due to a repetitive stress injury, although it can be caused by direct trauma as well. I'll show you guys a <clears throat> quick video in lecture as well, kind of breaking down carpal tunnel syndrome, but we have kind of touched on it quite a bit. Okay. So when the median nerve is compressed, we're going to see numbness and tingling in the median nerve distribution. So you can kind of see that palmar aspect of the hand, um, not including the fourth, uh, the fifth digit and half of the fourth digit. Okay. Pain and discomfort. People with CTS experience pain or aching in the wrist, hand and forearm. Um, it tends to be kind of like an achy pain. And remember the special test we can do, Phalen's reverse Phalen's to see if there is compression or even Tonell's sign, which is, remember Tonell's is that tapping on the wrist to see over the median nerve, does that increase symptoms, okay? And then weakness and decreased grip strength. If you have prolonged compression of the median nerve, the muscles will start to get weaker and weaker. So specifically the thenar eminence, right? Where that median nerve really takes over as far as innervation um, will start to decrease, okay? So it becomes difficult to grip stuff and perform fine motor skills. And sometimes you'll even see that thenar eminence kind of dissipate a little. And don't forget the one thenar muscle, intrinsic the thenar muscle that is innervated by the inner, inner nerve ulnar nerve, excuse me, is adductor pollicis. So that muscle will not be affected by a median nerve compression. Everything else, opponent's pollicis, flexor pollicis, abductor pollicis will all be affected, hence why that thenar eminence tends to shrink with severe cases of carpal tunnel. Okay, so median nerve, what does it innervate in the hands? Oh, we just talked about this. So flexor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis, and opponent's pollicis. And then loss again, also, I forgot, of the first two lumbrical muscles, okay? So damage to the median nerve may result in muscle wasting, as well as loss of the ability to perform the lumbar, lumbrical grip at the first and second phalanges, the MCP and PIP, MCP flexion, PIP extension, right, at those two. Okay, carpal tunnel syndrome, the treatment. So lifestyle modifications, right? If it's a repetitive stress injury, like they're typing at their computer and creating that um, inflammatory response, we need to have an ergonomic setup, okay? Um, we need to give them home exercise programs, ways to alleviate the pain. Sometimes they'll even give patients splints to wear at home or even at nighttime to um, kind of keep the wrist in a neutral position and relieve the pressure on the off the median nerve, okay? And we are doing what we always do. We are treating what we find, maybe nerve gliding, mobilization, ice. Um, and then we are maybe using modalities if we need to, to kind of treat the pain. And then we are kind of doing patient education as far as kind of how to type our posture. <clears throat> maybe we need to check out pronator terrace and see if it's involved as well. Okay. There's also corticosteroid injections. And if conservative treatment fails to produce or fails to pro provide relief, they can cut that carpal tunnel to release it and give more pressure or take some of the pressure off of that median nerve. Okay. Here's your little picture. <clears throat> of carpal tunnel syndrome, the background. Um, this is in your book, or sorry, not in your book. This is just in the PowerPoint slide. So make sure you take a look at this. That hand of benediction, um, the ape hand, the picture of the ape hand is because the thenar eminence disappears, right? So when you think about the difference between 
uh, what they say that between humans and apes is our opposition of our thumb. So an ape hand is kind of a play on the whole idea of opponent's policies is no longer working. So we essentially are are lose that ability to have opposition, hence ape, ape hand, okay? Hand of benediction, again, a patient cannot do that lumbrical grip. So they try to do that lumbrical grip and their hand does the exact opposite. It kind of pulls, um, it, it kind of sticks up like that and we end up getting one of our fingers can do it and the other one can't. And hand of benediction specifically comes from um, a Pope from a long time ago Kind of keeping his hands like that and hand of benediction is really interesting because it's one of those things where it's either passive or active and you can tell if it's either ulnar distribution or radial or excuse me median nerve distribution as far as the symptoms go so we'll talk about that a little bit more in class as well but look into hand of benediction if you can as far as the difference between um ulnar compression and median nerve compression okay and then there's the special test, Tunnel sign, Phelan maneuver, or even reverse Phelan. Okay, ulnar nerve. <clears throat> ulnar nerve can be entrapped at the cubital fossa or Guillain's tunnel. Okay, Guillain's tunnel right here on the ulnar aspect of the wrist. So the treatment focus is the same as for median nerve. We're treating what we find, we're gliding, we're taking down the inflammation, we're doing patient education. Remember, ulnar nerve entrapment at Guillain's tunnel is very common for bike riders. So we're assessing how are they holding the handles? Are they in full wrist extension and really compressing that ulnar aspect of their hand? Okay, we need to figure out, do they need to wear a splint in order to kind of hold it more lightly? Do they need bigger handlebars, right? Wrapping something around the handlebars to make it a bigger surface so they're not kind of putting their wrists in too much extension, okay? And then radial nerve. So entrapment at the lateral epicondyle beneath extensor carpi radialis brevis is, is usually the most common spot. It's not a very common nerve to um, treat as far as in the clinical world. But again, the treatments are the same for all of these nerve entrapment or compressions. Okay, <clears throat> CRPS. We will talk about this briefly because we've talked about CRPS a lot. Chronic pain condition that typically affects one limb, arm, hand, leg, or foot, characterized by intense and disproportionate pain that is often described as burning, throbbing, or shooting. The exact cause is not known, but it usually occurs after injury or trauma, including surgery. Again, surgery is trauma for our body, okay? So you're looking out for signs of CRPS as far as patient seems to be progressing, and then all of a sudden, they seem to be doing a little bit worse. They're having more pain, and they tell you something weird, like, my towel brushed up against my hand, and it really hurt. Okay, that's a weird sign, right? That's an aberrant sensation. A towel kind of brushing up your, your hand should not hurt. So we're kind of thinking about, you know, our, our, we're kind of keeping an eye out for symptoms of CRPS because, again, if we can get them to the phys physician sooner, then they have a better outlook as far as kind of long term um, how they're going to do. Okay. <clears throat> so some of you might have heard of reflex sympathetic dystrophy. That's kind of the old school name for type one CRPS. So type one CRPS is no known nerve injury or damage. So we maybe the patient had some trauma, but as far as all tests and measures show, there's no nerve damage, but for some reason they are dispelling, um, they are showing significant nerve pain, hence CRPS, okay? Type two is CRPS with a known nerve injury. So maybe we know that they had a very, very bad median nerve injury or ulnar nerve injury, okay? and But they develop CRPS as a result. But at least we know we have a distinct reason as to why they developed it. <clears throat> okay, so signs and symptoms, again, there they are. Um, you can use the um, acronym STAMP, so sensory. Um, allodynia, hyper or hyperalgesia or hyperparesthesia, okay? And trophic changes. Trophic changes would be like skin, hair, and nail changes, okay? So the hair can be fall off. The skin can get really shiny. The nails can kind of change in their, um, the way that they look. They almost become a little bit like a more clubby. And then autonomic swelling, edema, sweating, okay, things become just very, very, that autonomic nervous system kicks in, that fight or flight, okay? 
And then motor. So weakness, contractures, or atrophy. Can we picture why there would be weakness? Well, if we don't want to use our hand because it's hurting all the time, we're going to get weak, right? Same thing with contractures. If we're holding our hand in a position that's comfortable, we're not moving it, we're going to start to develop contractures. And then, of course, pain is the main symptom. Okay, and there's a picture for you <clears throat> just talking about Again, the kind of weird sympathetic response that maybe leads to CRPS, right? We have that fight or flight response that for some reason doesn't want to shut off for these patients. And treatment, okay, multidisciplinary approach, um, definitely use of psychologist or a psychiatrist because it's very a difficult diagnosis to be able to have a hand or a foot out and have no idea as to like exactly why it's happening. Um, and then PTA, Observe and report the patient's response to treatment, maybe doing a lot of desensitization, maybe gentle rubbing, some mirror therapy, showing them maybe their good hand or their bad hand in a mirror and kind of creating the illusion to, their, to try to trick their brain into understanding that there's nothing wrong with their hand, right? Because it comes down to the nervous system is for some reason overacting. <coughs> Okay, so there's a lot we can do for CRPS. Um, we could go into more detail if we want in lab someday. Um, it's a difficult diagnosis to treat and it doesn't always work out because physical therapy is actually one of those things that's very painful for these patients, unfortunately, and that becomes hard for them as far as compliance goes, as you can picture. Okay.